the potter and the clay. Has anyone here ever had the fun pleasure of working with clay on a potter's wheel? It's a lot of fun. If you hadn't ever tried it, um, we used to have a, a, a friend of ours, I don't know what happened to him, but he was um, the man who originally established at Eureka Springs at the uh, Passion Play out there, the potter's house. And he would do pottery and tell the parables of the pottery as he did pottery. And I had him come to our first church, oh, a couple decades ago. He came out there and spoke and did the pottery. It was an awesome experience. And he had my wife and I, they used to own a motel out there in Eureka Springs. And he'd let us come once a year, actually for free, and not charge us anything, and just hang out out there. Just a really, really neat guy. But there's so much to be learned from this parable of the potter and the clay. And I want to talk to you about it this morning. God is the potter and not us. Someone say amen. amen. Now, that may sound like a simple truth. But how many of you know that living that truth is an act of obedience on our part every day? It's an act of obedience saying, Lord, not my will, but your will be done today. Someone say amen. amen. So the first thing we need to know right off the bat, that he is the potter and you are not the potter. How many of you have ever wanted to be the potter in your own life? Amen. Mold yourself, shape yourself, make your own designs, your own plans. You can try. How many of you know it never turns out too well? Amen. <laughs> All right, let's start with Psalm 100, verse 3. How many of you recall Psalm 100, the Psalm, verses 1 through 5, that we opened up with this morning? But this is verse 3. It says, Know that the Lord, He is God. I love that. That tells me, you know what? Number one, know that the Lord, He's God and not me. Someone say amen. amen. You're not God of your own life. How many of you know that even as believers, we get into trouble when we try to direct our own path, we try to make our own game plan, we try to fulfill our own vision? He's God, not me. How many of you know there's freedom once you realize that? There's freedom from always worrying about the future. How many of you worry about a lot about the future? How many of you think you probably worry way too much about the future than you should? Listen, guys, He is God. Amen? He wants you to learn to enjoy the moment of today. Tomorrow is going to come. With you or without you, it's coming. Amen? And that doesn't mean you never have a game plan. It just means you're not consumed by your vision of your future. You're consumed by Jesus' vision of who he wants you to be today. Everybody say today. I call it living in the moment. Living in the moment is liberating. Amen. There's freedom, there's joy in that. Because you're not worried about yesterday because you can't change it, can you, Johan? You can't go back and fix yesterday's mistakes. Anybody ever make a mistake yesterday? Yesterday years? And tomorrow hasn't come, so you can't stress about that. Didn't Jesus actually say, take no thought of tomorrow? I don't know. I think it's kind of important when the Lord says something, amen? Take no thought of tomorrow and we get just consumed by it. Sufficient is today. Live for today. Know that the Lord, he is God, is he who has made us and not we ourselves. Amen. For some people, that's a revelation. You didn't make yourself. <laughs> Amen. Did you know that God knew you while you were yet in your mother's womb? He knew you. Yes, even before the foundation of the world, but while you were in your mother's womb, he knew you and called you because he's God. He made us, not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of whose pastor? His pastor. His pastor. Now, how many of you know sheep, they don't really care whose grass they're eating as long as they're eating grass, am I right? They're grazing here and grazing there. But how many of you know that the shepherd cares because the shepherd wants you eating from his pasture. Listen, there's a lot of pastures out there today that people are gnawing on and chewing from that are not God's pastures. We need to make sure that the pastures we're chewing on are from him. Amen? We're his sheep. He's made us, not we ourselves. We're his people, the sheep of his pasture. Can you all click me, please, Josh? 
God is the potter. He has made you. Now, why is that so important? Because if he's made you, then that means I want him to allow, I want to allow him to shape me and to mold me and to make me the way he chooses, the way he sees fit, not the way I think he should make me and mold me. Amen? How many of you who have ever worked with clay, can you imagine if you were shaping a beautiful bowl and that bowl starts talking to you and saying, I really don't want to be shaped like you're shaping me. I'd rather be shaped like this. How many of you think, oh, okay. Sorry I didn't listen to you in the first place, Mr. Clay. Or how many of you think we just take and scrunch it down and start over? <laughs> and stop talking to me, Clay. And yet, how many times do God's people complain to God about how God's made them? Well, God, you didn't give me these talents or these gifts or this gift or this or that. Listen, God made you just the way he wanted to make you, amen? And did you know he loves you and likes you just the way he made you? Now, Hollywood has this thing where, you know, uh, uh, and, and talk to the women for a minute because keeping up with the Kardashians. You know, I, I don't understand that, but in all these magazines, they're always the Kardashians this, Kardashians that. And somehow these, this dysfunctional family of sisters have become role models and celebrities and made millions off of their dysfunctionality, if that's even a word, and they've made millions off of this, and these women and young women see them as their role model in this age of dysfunction. And I want you to know that God wants to shape us, and he's going to shape you and make you an original model. Amen? He's not going to shape you like the Kardashians. Someone say, thank God. Amen. He's going to shape you just the way he wants you to be. Amen? But you see... Even Hollywood and the celebrities have made this standard of this is what men should look like and women should look like. And, you know, uh, I was perusing through Facebook the other day, and there's this new app. It was advertised in this app where you can take your body, men, without a shirt, and you take a picture of your body, and you click a few buttons, and it gives you muscles and abs and everything. I mean, it makes you look studly. And I was thinking, you know, we've turned that into the ideal of what a man should look like. Now, there's nothing wrong with being fit, but how many of you know God's more concerned about the inward person of who you are, amen, than the outward person? He is the potter. He has made you. We must stop trying to make ourselves. And even as believers, week in and week out, we come up with our own thoughts, our own plans, our own schemes instead of submitting to the will of God. And submitting to his will isn't hard, guys. It's simply saying, okay, Dad, I'll do it. Amen? Okay, Dad. How many of you have ever had children and said, okay, Dad, and did it? And maybe it's the same child, I ain't going to do that. Well, not in anybody's house here, but it happened somewhere out there in some parenting excursion. Is our ambition for his kingdom or for our own? In other words, what's our ambition? Is our ambition, are we living for God's kingdom or are we living for our own kingdom to do our own thing? Did you know you can make a kingdom and call it God's kingdom? What do I mean by that? You can go through life and cloak your plans in a spirit of religion, always trying to get God to bless it. Or you can yield to him and find out what his plan is for your life. It's a lot harder to yield to him and find out what his plan is. Why? Why is that harder? Listen, if you have your own plan, you're trying to do it. We're creatures of habit. We're creatures who like to be doing something. And uh, I'll never forget as a young evangelist, man, I knew God had called me to the ministry. So I just got to pass out more business cards. And I've got to tell more folks, you got to have me come speak. And the more business cards I passed out, the more discouraged I got. Because you know how many calls I ever got off a business card? If I say zero? zero? Zero. But I was young and dumb. Emphasis on dumb. And I was trying to do this thing because I knew God had a calling on my life. So I was going to try to make it happen. And how many of you know, whenever you try to make something happen, it doesn't happen the way you think? You'll end up doing more by accident for God than you will on purpose. Amen? And the longer I live 
And the more I say, you know what? Giving it all to you, Jesus. Then all of a sudden, the more he begins to work through me and in me to where I'm having to turn down stuff to do. So I got so much stuff to do. Are you following me? And that's God, and that's the way he wants to be in your life. In Jeremiah 18, verse 1 through 3, it says, The word which came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise. Now, Jeremiah was a prophet, and the Spirit of God came to Jeremiah, and the Spirit of God says to him in verse 2, Jeremiah, arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause you to hear my words. I love this. You know, here the Spirit of God speaks to Jeremiah and says, Jeremiah, all I want you to do is go down to the potter's house. I want you to listen for my voice. You know, sometimes God will just speak to you to go sit by a lake and not do anything and just try to hear his voice, amen? Or to get alone with him and spend some time with him and hear his voice, amen? He is speaking all the time. The problem is never in God speaking, but it's in us tuning in and shutting down and getting quiet enough to hear his voice. So it's fascinating here that the Spirit of God says, Jeremiah, go to the potter's house, and once you're there, I'm going to cause you to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and there he was. Who? A potter. Making something at the wheel. Well, that's what potters do at the potter's house. They make pottery on this huge wheel. Kara and I used to go out to East Texas, a place called Longview, Texas, and there was this uh, lawn and garden and pottery shop, but they actually made pottery there. You could actually sit there and watch them. And because I like to do weird things, when I was a kid, I actually took classes trying to figure out and learn how to make pottery. And I loved painting ceramics and stuff like that. It was fascinating. So here, Jeremiah, maybe he had never been to a potter's house before. He was familiar with pottery. They all were. But maybe he never watched how it was done. So God instructs him, says, Jeremiah, just go down and just watch. And while you're watching, I'm going to speak to you about something that pertains to life, to Israel, and to your life. And so what I want you to do is I want you to watch a short clip for a minute. There's no sound with it. So sound guys, don't freak out when there's no audio. Just want you to watch this minute clip for a minute, just a minute. So Jeremiah was instructed to learn something by watching the potter. Just the fact that Jeremiah would go and obey God. And like I said, there's a lot we can learn just sometimes by observing what's around us. Amen? So I want you to watch this clip. That's a potter's wheel. That's the potter and that's the clay. See if the Lord speaks to you about your life. Kind of mesmerizing, isn't it? Perfect. Listen, Jeremiah 18, 4 through 6. Verse 4 says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. And literally, the potter, there on the potter's wheel, as you saw, had made a vessel, but somehow he messed up, and it was marred. And so he took the clay, and he lumped it back down again, and he started over. Everybody say he started over. Listen to me, guys. Aren't you glad that God can take something that's marred, start again with our life, and turn it into a beautiful creation? Amen. I love that. God has a plan for our life. Amen? It's not the plan that you think you have. It's the plan he has. And ultimately, if you keep yourself on the potter's wheel, 
How many of you saw that clay jumping off the potter's wheel? It wasn't, was it? Did you see legs come up under the clay and it started just hopping off and jumped off? Isn't that what we do, though? We laugh, but that's exactly what we do. We're on the potter's wheel, and God's turning us and making us into the vessel he chooses us to be. And sometimes we just grow legs, and we say, Lord, I'm not really happy with this design. And often we hop off of the potter's wheel. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Now here God's speaking to the house of Israel, but he could just as well be speaking to each of us in our lives today, amen? And saying to you, can I not do with your life as I design and I desire? I'm the potter, you're the clay. You remember when God asked Moses to be his spokesman and to go back and deliver the nation of Hebrews from the hand of the Egyptians? And Moses started to put up a fuss and said, well, God, I'm not eloquent. I can't speak. You need to find somebody else. My brother speaks better than me. This really isn't what I feel called to do. I mean, he just went on and on and on. Are you following me? And we do that all the time, giving God all kinds of excuses why we can't live for him and do the work of his kingdom for him. And I'm here to tell you, if you'll simply yield yourself to God and every morning say, Lord, you are the potter. And Father, I am the clay. I yield myself to your hand to shape me, to mold me as you desire, to use me today as you desire in my life, in Jesus' name. Easy prayer, isn't it? And then if you would yield yourself to that every day, you'll find over the course of weeks, months, and years that as you yield yourself to his hand, he will begin to shape you and mold you into somebody you couldn't even imagine. Amen? You couldn't even imagine. People who know you today, who knew you way back when, are going to think, well, you sound the same, you kind of look the same, maybe you've gained a pound or two, but you know what? You're not the same person. Well, that old me is dead, amen? That person's gone. I'm new in Jesus. He is shaping me and molding me. And if you're new as a new person in the kingdom of God or new in a new relationship or a fresh walk with the Lord, you need to hear today that God is the potter. You are the clay. You need to allow him to shape you and mold you. And in your life, there will come tribulation, there will come struggles, there will come difficult times. But if you'll stay on the potter's wheel and not hop off, he's going to use all those things to turn you into a beautiful piece of work fit for the kingdom of God. Amen? And fit for his use. I want to be used of God. I want to be a vessel that he can pour into and pour out of. Amen? And I can't be a vessel he can pour into if I'm full of myself. Does that make sense? If I'm full of me, I've got to empty me of me. That sounds weird. But I've got to empty me of me to allow God to shine forth his life and his light through me. That's the only way we can do it, amen? Because how many of you know, you full of you doesn't really attract anybody to God's kingdom, does it? It really doesn't. They don't want to see us. They want to see Jesus. Amen? Why are young people being turned off by church? I'm going to tell you a secret. The church isn't the sheetrock. It's not because our buildings aren't nice enough. It's because they're not seeing Jesus in the lives of believers. When they see Jesus reflect in the life of a believer, they'll be attracted to God again. Amen? When we stop reflecting Jesus, who are we reflecting? Yourself. And honestly... I mean, your spouse might love you, but you might have some friends, but nobody's going to like, wow, just want to fall head over heels in love with the kingdom of God because of you. They're going to want to fall in love with the kingdom of God because of Jesus and because of Jesus who they see in you and who they see in me. Does that make sense? Now yeah, watch the rest of this. Is that the same clip? 
well, we're not going to watch the rest of that. I had it fixed anyway. Sorry about that. It showed the rest. Did you all see a beautiful bowl you turned it into? That's what it showed. It showed what it became. You see, guys, don't get so focused on the vessel you are today. Just know the vessel you are today, God is using that to prepare you to be who you're going to be tomorrow. Amen? Who you're going to be tomorrow. And I love this. Jeremiah 18.4 says, And the vessel they made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again into another vessel, as it seemed good to the potter to make. Adam's sin has marred us all. Someone say amen. How many of you know when he sinned against God, that brought a ruination to all of us? Amen? But the Holy Spirit has made us again. Everyone say made us again made us again into another vessel. And listen, guys, this vessel is shaped like the new man. And who is the new man shaped after and reflecting? The person of Jesus, amen? This new man, no more barbarian or Scythian, Greek, Gentile, or Jew, but fashioned after a new man who is designed to reflect the person of Jesus in all of his holiness and righteousness and joy and peace and love. The Holy Spirit has made us again into another vessel. So if he's made me into another vessel, why do I keep growing legs, hopping off the potter's wheel, and wanting to go back to that old ruined, marred thing? Amen? It's marred, guys. It's ruined. It can't hold the Spirit of God. You can't put God's Spirit in old wineskins. Someone say amen. You put God's Spirit in old wineskins, those wineskins are going to pop, burst just not meant to hold it. Amen? You've got to put that new wine into a new wineskin. God's making you into a new vessel to hold more of him. Now, why is this important? This is important because I believe prophetically for the year 2018, the Holy Spirit has shown me that God is wanting to wake up his church. I say his church. I'm talking about the people in churches all over the United States of America, and wanting them to walk in the person of this new man. And God will begin to prophesy through them and use them and reflect Jesus through them in ways they couldn't imagine. It's not going to be preachers that reach America for Christ. Do you know that? It's going to be you guys who reach America for Jesus. It's going to be everyday men and women, moms and soccer moms, teachers and engineers who are on fire for Jesus, allowing Jesus to live out their life through them, that's going to reach this nation for God. I believe that with all my heart. Amen? <clears throat> In verse 6 it says, O house of Israel, how can I, oh, he says, can I not do with you as this potter, says the Lord? Look, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are you in my hand, O house of Israel. Who has control of the clay? Is the clay forming anything about itself? How many of you saw that clay working real hard? All the clay had to do was what? Be clay. Did you know that's how easy it is to be a believer? All you have to do is be clay in God's hand. Putty in his hands. He'll shape you and mold you and make you the men and the women he designed to be. But if you grow legs and you start hopping off the potter's wheel making the Holy Ghost chase you down, that's when we get into trouble. Amen? Find contentment at being in his hand. There is contentment at knowing, Lord, I am the clay. You mold me any way you desire, and I'll be happy with that. Amen? As long as I'm being molded by the hand of the potter, I'm happy. Someone say amen. So there's contentment at being in his hand. Quit complaining about how God has made you. And be thankful from your heart. Amen? I hear people all the time complaining. Oh, man, they're just complaining to God because God made them this way or that way or didn't give them this gift or that gift or this town or that town. Listen, instead of looking at what you don't have, look at what God has given you. Amen? And if he's the potter and you're the clay, he's given you just what he wants you to have. And those of you who do have those gifts, you can't take credit for that. It's a gift. You didn't put it there yourself, amen? They were showing some prodigy on television. 
the other day on the news. This kid just, uh, he was like, I can't remember how old he was. I want to say maybe nine or 10 years old. He just walked up to a piano and he just began to play. Never played in his life. He didn't do that to himself. That was a gift from God. Are you following me? Those of you with high intellect, you didn't do that to yourself. That's a gift from God. Amen? Matter of fact, there's not a lot you can take credit for. Unless you cut your hair and it looks good. Amen? But you didn't even make your hair grow, did you? Or make it not grow in some of y'all's cases. Sorry, Johan, one look at you. No, I'm kidding, bro. I love you. Listen, we have no control, really, over much of our life. Amen? And it bothers us when we think about that. How many of you are kind of like little control freaks? I like, how many of you have a hard time riding with other people driving? All right, thank you. So you've got some control issues, all right? I'm not talking about driving. I, we'd all have a hard time driving some wino or something, somebody drunk. But, I mean, if you have a hard time driving with other people, I do, then, you know, it's, I'm fine as long as I'm driving, okay? One day when I'm on an airplane soon, I bet if I were flying the airplane, I'd be fine. But I have to trust God to work through somebody I've never met and trust that he's having a really good day. And that the mechanics, Larry, worked on the airplane, did really well, amen? There's a lot of trust issues there. Control is about not trust, amen? Not controlling is about trusting God to work through you. And releasing control, it's hard. Anybody else out there ever have control things? I mean, you got to release control. Releasing control of your finances. Uh-oh. That's hard. That's hard. Doing things God's way, that's hard. Why? Because you got to trust God. You see, you're the potter. I mean, he's the potter. We're the clay. you got to trust God with that stuff. Amen. Quit jumping off the potter's wheel. Turn to your neighbor and say, quit jumping off the potter's wheel. <laughs> now... Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm going to quit jumping off the pyre's wheel. That's a little harder, isn't it? It's easy to tell them to quit jumping. It's harder to tell yourself. <laughs> now, this was Israel's response to Jeremiah, and this is fascinating. So Jeremiah went down to the potter's house. He watched the potter. He learned the lesson of the potter. He learned the parable of the potter. And he went back and he shared with Israel what God had said, that God wants to be the potter. He wants them to be the clay. He wants to shape them and mold them and be a special father to them. The same message he has for us. Now look at what Israel's response to them was. In verse 12, Jeremiah 18, and they said, that's hopeless. In other words, it's hopeless for us to trust that God's going to mold us and shape us. So instead of trusting God, we're going to walk according to our own plans. And we will, everyone, obey the dictates of his evil heart. Ugh. Someone say ugh. ugh. Now you say, well, how dare Israel? Well, how dare us? Yeah. How many times have we maybe not spoken those words, but done those words? And we say, God, I'm not going to do things your way. I'm going to do them my way. And we end up doing it in whatever area of our life. Amen? There are two responses to God wanting to work in our lives. You ready? Here they are. We stay on the potter's wheel and allow God to do what's needed in our life. That's response number one. Or response number two is we jump off the potter's wheel and forbid God to mold our life. Those are the only two responses. You're either on the wheel or off the wheel. On the wheel or off the wheel. On the wheel or off the wheel. Amen? And if you're on the wheel, guys, stay on the wheel. Let God shape you and mold you. And if you're off the wheel, I've got good news for you. Today, through repentance and through the name of Jesus, God can strengthen you to hop back on the wheel. Hop back on the wheel. Amen? I want to be on the wheel. How many of you want to be on the wheel? Amen? I want to be on the wheel. I don't want to say, like Israel said, it's hopeless, and I'm going to walk according to my own plans. I'm going to shape my own destiny and shape my own life. And I can tell you, it ends in failure. You don't believe that? Read some obituaries of people who shape their own lives. 
They were a member of the Lions Club. They played chess every Thursday. May their soul rest in peace. To have spent and wasted an entire life outside of God's kingdom and God's purpose and God's plan. It's heartbreaking. Heartbreaking. You know, I lost a brother last month. Was it last two months ago? <clears throat> and he knew my stand on Jesus. And I don't, can't honestly say, I hadn't talked to him in a long time, if he ever repented and came to the Lord. I hope he did. But I'm not sure he did. And I think, you know, going through life to work to make a paycheck, to pay your bills, just to die and have no eternal riches, what a waste. What a waste, amen? So thank God that you and I get to be a vessel, an earthen vessel, a pottery vessel in God's kingdom. Better to be a piece of clay on God's turntable than to be a piece of clay in the world, on the devil's turntable or on your own turntable. Amen. You will never stay on the molding wheel of God if you first don't understand God's role in your role. And God's role is he is the potter. Your role, you are the clay. Listen, I hate to tell you this, but the Lord has all the work to do. He's the potter. I don't know about you. I didn't see that clay working real hard. Did you? It's just sitting there being clay. I did that pretty good. It's just sitting there being clay doing its thing. It wasn't having to work. There is a rest that belongs to the people of God. And I'm going to tell you, that rest comes when you seek your seek God and stop striving and recognize, Lord, every day I'm going to yield myself to your hand. There's such a peace that comes with that. I can't, I can't, can't express that. Does that make sense? Such a peace that comes from not just saying that, but living that. Saying, God, I'm just going to yield to your way and your will. Amen? And then all of a sudden you find that he's stretching you this way and pulling you this way just so you can hold more of him. Amen? God is the potter. We are the clay. He is the Lord. We are not. Amen? How many of you know there's a lot of people in America that's an eyeful right there? A lot of believers. They think God was put on the universe to serve them. And I'm telling you, God serves, but it's not at our request. It's because of who he is. Amen? If you don't realize that simple truth, <clears throat> then you will struggle to stay on God's wheel. And that simple truth is that he is the Lord and we are not. Matter of fact, Jesus is Lord is more than just words that we say. He's either Lord of all of our life or he's not Lord at all. To be Lord means to be the potter. Amen? We're allowing him to shape even those areas of our life. We're like, Lord, you can touch these areas over here, but don't touch this area over here. That's off limits. Are you following me? And those are those areas that we struggle and wrestle to trust God with. Verse 20, Romans 9. Some New Testament for you, just so you don't think I'm stuck in the Old Testament. Same God, one God. Everybody say one God. But who are you, my friend, to talk back to God? A clay pot does not ask the man who made it, why did you make me like this? Someone say amen. Wow. I wonder if Paul had read Jeremiah. Of course he had. A clay pot doesn't ask the man who made it, why did you make me like this? How many of you said you've worked with clay? When you were working with clay, how many of you had your clay ask you why you were shaping it like that? Kevin, it hurts. Don't stretch me like that. Shape me like this. I want to be round, not square. I mean, that would be crazy if your clay talked, amen? But how many of you know that we talk to God and act God all the time, amen? Instead of yielding to him. Why did you make me like this? Verse 21, after all, the man who makes the pots has the right to use the clay as he wishes. Someone say amen. And to make two pots from the same lump of clay, one for special occasions, the other for ordinary use. Amen. I'm going to gross you out for a minute. You ready? Here we go. Listen to me. 
you can take a lump of clay, a big thing of clay, giant thing of clay, from a piece of it, a potter on his potter's wheel can mold the most beautiful china plate. How many of you remember back in days when people used china? I know it's not like the thing anymore, but you used to give china when people got married. Today you give china, they'll look at you and like, what do I do with this? <laughs> we don't paper plates. <laughs> and that would be used. But then they'd take that same piece of clay, send it down to Echo in Mexico, and they turn it into a porcelain toilet. Both were made from the same clay. One is for honor and one is not. You follow me? But both are made from the same clay. So who is to say to the potter, why have you made one this and one you've made that? He's the potter. He has control over the clay. He can mold us and shape us any way he desires. Amen? But don't blame God when you're the one hopping off the potter's wheel. God, you're not making me the way I want to be made. Well, he's like, stay on the potter's wheel and I will. How many of you know God is faithful? He's speaking to those that have a God-defying attitude. God does not answer to us, but we answer to him. Someone say amen. I love that. The analogy of potter and clay is to show us that God has a purpose for us and will make something beautiful of our lives if we will let him. We have a choice whether we will allow him to mold us. Clay is useless, shapeless, has no purpose until someone takes it, gives it purpose, beauty, and shape. Amen? His patience is to bring us to repentance, just like he tried to do with the nation of Israel. That's why he's so patient with us. Someone say amen. Now I want to share this quick story with you, and then I'm going to close. There was once a couple, a husband and wife. They had a waterbed. And on, you all remember the waterbeds? They were popular back, I'm going to show my age, back in the 1970s and 80s. I tried laying in one once. It was like the worst experience ever. <laughs> but anyway, they had these waterbeds, and they looked cool. And as a kid, I mean a waterbed, if you had a waterbed, you were like something in the eyes of a child. And so this couple had a waterbed, and they woke up one night, uh, I'm sorry, one morning early, and there was a big puddle of water on their waterbed. So they took the waterbed mattress out, they rolled it outside, and they and their house were up on a hill, and so they decided, well, we're going to fill it back up with water, and we're going to look and see if we can't spot the leak. <clears throat> so their house was on the hill, and they rolled the mattress out. Well, the mattress, unfortunately, once they started filling it with water, it rolled all the way down the hill. And when it rolled into the hill and came to the bottom, it landed in a pile of thorn bushes. And it got all tangled up in these horrible, terrible thorns. And how many of you know that the thorns tore to shreds that waterbed? So they said, you know what? There's no repairing this. It's beyond repair. What we'll do is we'll just go and get a new bed. So they went and they got a new bed. They put it in their room. The next morning they woke up and there was the same puddle of water on their bed. Then they realized it wasn't the bed that was leaking. It was the roof. <laughs> the moral of the story is we're trying to solve the wrong problem in our life, guys. The problem is never with God the Father, but always with our willingness to stay on the molding wheel. God is never the problem. Someone say amen. Oh, it just irks, that's a good word, irks, vexes, I'll use a Bible word. It vexes me when people in the world proclaim that they're mad at God because God didn't do this or God didn't do that or this or that. Listen, the problem is never, everyone say never. Never, never I mean never, ever, 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 ever with God. Amen. So if the problem is never, ever, 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 to the one millionth power with God, who's that leave? Uh-oh, leaves me. Well, what do people not want to do? Take responsibility for themselves. So the problem's never with the Father, but it's with our willingness to stay on the molding wheel. He provides the material, the patience, the skill, the precision to make us a masterpiece. All the work is done by the powder. You don't have to do much of anything. All you have to do is Yield and submit. Everyone say yield and submit. Yield. 
yield and submit. As long as we're under construction, we're becoming the person God intends us to be. 